her sing it in that way. She did a really good job. It's kind of a tough song in some ways, many ways. So thank you. Uh, Daniel chapter 3, we're going to look at a couple other passages as well before we get back into it. Specifically, verse 8 is where we're going to be. Uh, Daniel chapter 8. Um, uh, I'm sorry, cha Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. Let's put it that way. And that, that'll fit better. You'll, you'll be right with the message if you look there. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about stressful situations and a tendency we have in, in, in times of stress to, uh, to maybe do something that, that we would call catastrophize. Anybody in here, do you make mountains out of molehills? Wait a minute. Man, you can't, point at, you can't point at your husband. Or your wife. Uh, whew. Sorry. <laughs> let, me, let me ask. Personally speaking, do you make mountains out of molehills? Uh, a, a lot of folks do. Or, you know, it, it's a term that's called catastrophizing, and basically what you do is you make everything into sort of a catastrophe. Now, maybe not everything, but I mean, especially those things that are stressful and cause some sort of anxiety in, in, in your life. And, and I want to, I guess I ought, I ought to stop here for just a second and tell you that some people would say, well, what's the difference between stress and anxiety and the subject matter that we covered last week, which was um, worry? And there is a difference. I mean, remember what I said last week about worry. About 90% of the things that we worry about are never going to happen to us anyway. Stress and anxiety are very real. There are things that happen to us. And so this morning we're just going to talk about over, overcoming stress and anxiety or, or, or maybe a better way is coping through it. Um, but if you learn you know, this coping mechanism that we're going to talk about this morning, um, then you pretty much have overcome stress and anxiety. Not that you're never going to go through anxious moments or be, you know, feel stressful or whatever. And I think that's the, the, the major difference between uh, worry and concern and, and those things. And Jesus said, you know, do not worry over these things. But Jesus never said that there weren't going to be hardships. In fact, one of the things that he says is in this life there will be many troubles. There will be trials. And so that's the difference between uh, last week and this week and, and, and what we're looking at. Um, stress, if, if you're to define stress or, or to look at what causes stress, stress generally takes place because we're caught unprepared, okay? Or at least we perceive that we're unprepared for something. Someone asks you to do something at the last moment, and so you feel a little stressed out. You know, a lot of times it's simply because of circumstances that we face, maybe even poor planning. This past week, uh, I was asked to speak months ago, and my wife was so nice to point this out to me, that it was months ago that I was asked to speak at the Midwest Seniors Conference on Tuesday of this past week. And, uh, and I had three sessions to do, I mean, the same thing kind of over and over again, but three back-to-back -back sessions, and I came home, Monday is my day off, and I came home uh, from, from fishing uh, with Mark Pittman, always blame it on someone else, uh, but we, we fished over on the Wabash, and we, we went from six in the morning till about four in the afternoon, and, and I came home to tell my wife, you know, I, now I have bowling tonight. But then after that, I've got to go to the church for a great majority of the night because I've got to get ready for tomorrow. Anybody else in here procrastinate? And the rest of you are lying. Um, for, you know, I, I had procrastinated. I mean, I had a general idea of where I was going. I knew what you know, my text was. I knew what the subject matter was. And, and, uh, and so uh, I came in, and, and, and about 6 in the morning... Um, I started to feel a little bit anxious. Everything was done, but it was in, in that time that I was printing all of these handouts that I was going to use that day. 
And, uh, and, and I got a little overwhelmed because I was thinking, man, are they going to get it? Do you know how long it takes to print off 400 handouts? I, I didn't. I do now. You know, but I kept thinking, am I going to ha have time to get home and get a shower? Am I going to have time to get cleaned up, get down there on time? And, of course, everything worked out. You know, sometimes we bring stress and anxiety on ourselves. Uh, many times it's because of, like I said, overwhelming circumstances. Maybe, you know, maybe there's a, a layoff and then you turn around and you have a health need and, and your, your, your insurance, you know, may not be there any longer. And, and, and just we face those sorts of things and we're always going to face them. Amen. I mean, they're going to be a part of our lives. Well, the good news for you this morning um, well, actually, let me ask you this. Have you ever looked like this guy? You know, maybe some of you look like that about midweek every week, you know? And, and, and so that's kind of the idea of stress and anxiety. Now, the good news, I mean, the great news that we have for you this morning is that we have a solution. We have a solution to all your stress where you will never be stressed again. And here it is. The stress reduction kit. And if you can't read those directions, it says place kit on firm surface. Follow directions and circle of kit. Bang your head here. Repeat step two as necessary or until unconscious. If you're unconscious, then cease stress reduction activity. You know, you ever feel like that? You just want to bang your head against the wall or something. To, now, now, in all seriousness, uh, in talking about the, the stress and anxiety in our lives, I believe that Daniel chapter 3 is going to help us out a little bit. Now, before we get to that actual text, I just want to share with you three things. Um, there are actually a total of five uh, keys to, to overcoming stress, and three of them... Three of them are just reminders beforehand, okay? Because here's, here's the deal. Even, even if we can deal with the stress in our own lives, all you've got to do is turn on the television and watch the news or watch reports, and, and they have you stressed out all over again. We spent some time talking about this in our Thursday morning Bible study this past week, how in this life, in this culture that we live in, um, it's almost like they want to keep you constantly stirred up. And, and I really believe that they do. Um, our news networks, all of it, they keep you stirred up. I mean, how much good news do you actually hear? Maybe a little blurb at the end of everything. You know, they tell us. I, I, heard, I heard an illustration put like this, that... Most of the people who lived through the Great Depression didn't really realize that they were poor. And the reason they didn't realize they were poor is because everyone else was in the same circumstance. And they didn't have news networks 24 hours a day telling them how bad off they are. That's what we face in our culture today. Um, people telling us how bad off we are, how how much better it could be if this, this, and this, or if this particular person is, is voted in. And, and, and honestly, they keep, they keep us stirred up. So if you don't have any stress in your life, go home today, watch CNN or Fox all day long, and, and you'll, by the end of the day, feel pretty stressed because uh, we've got it bad. We've got it bad. Uh, I always wonder whether those news anchors and people who re make those reports, have they ever visited the Dominican Republic or Haiti or India or just any part of the world? Because in comparison, folks, and I know we don't like hearing this because we're Americans, in comparison, we, we are well off. We are set. There is no comparison. And so uh, this morning we're going we're gonna to look at you know, how God can help us overcome 
this stress and anxiety in our lives. Number one, God is holy and good. God is holy and good. Now that's one of the things that um, that's one of the things that we were reminded of um, in the song service this morning. Uh, am I preaching okay? Okay, just wondering. I figure if I sit and listen when other people are up here, maybe it would be a good idea if people listen while I'm up here. Thanks. God is holy and good. He's not driven by mood. He's not driven by the economy. He's not driven by any of those sorts of things that, that drive us towards stress and anxiety. Um, and, and I think we forget that. I think we forget the fact that he is indeed um, good. His character never changes. Uh, God desires the very best for us. The problem that we face is there's an issue of sin that, that is in the picture in this life. I mean, beforehand, when Adam and Eve were walking with God in the garden... Uh, it says that they would walk with him in the cool of the evening and they would discuss things with him and things were good. And then sin, sin enters the picture and, and it messes everything up. It messes our relationship with him up. It messes the way that we think up. It messes our relationship with one another and our relationship with the earth. And so there are so many things that are just, and forgive me if this offends you, but they're just screwed up because of sin being in the picture. And one of the things is the way that we see him. We tend to think that he's very much like us and he's influenced by, uh, by the news. You know, God is holy and good. Nothing ever catches him by surprise. And his character never, ever changes. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, if you want to turn there, I would invite you to do that. In Matthew 7, 9 through 11, it's a Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is speaking here, and he's saying to, um, to his, uh, his disciples, those who are, who are there on that hillside listening to him uh, share this message, he says to them in uh, verses 9 through 11, which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them to do, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And so Jesus basically says to the people, you know, which of you, if your son asks for bread, is going to give him a, a stone? You know, give him a bad gift. Yesterday we were able to celebrate uh, Riker's second birthday. Uh, Brock and Emily and Riker and, and Me uh, Megan and Robbie are getting ready to go on vacation. And so we celebrated uh, the birthday party a little early. And they gave him this awesome gift. I mean, every child who was there thought it was awesome, including some really big kids. You know, like me and Brian and... Uh, Brock, but but it's a train set, okay? It's a it's a train it's it's a train table, right? And it's kind of made out it's made out of wood and it has all this uh, all these these cars that go on them. They're connected magnetically, and 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 the the cool thing was is that Riker, from the time that he opened that one, Riker never left that table unless they made him. As people were leaving, Riker, go give him a hug and a kiss. You know, back over here. And, and, and I mean, he just constantly was at that table. Now, here's what Jesus says. If we, and I'm not, you know, when I say this, <laughs> I certainly don't look at Brock and, and Emily as, as being evil, but what Jesus is saying is in comparison to the Father, you know, who alone is good, if we who are evil are capable of giving good gifts to our children, then how much more does God give us in his goodness 
and his mercies. And as Kara sang this morning, maybe sometimes even in those moments when we think, when we think that it's not a good thing, maybe God is in, in fact blessing us to protect us from something else. Um, what if his blessings come through raindrops? What if his healing comes through tears? Um, so God is holy and good, and we either believe that and, and, and understand that about him, or, or we continue to face stress uh, in an unhealthy way. I mean, this is the basis for overcoming stress and anxiety in your life by understanding that God is holy and good. Secondly, you can believe his promise. You can believe his promise. Now, from time to time, you know, we all, we probably all break our promises. I was just sharing with a, a couple this past week that the importance within a relationship to keep your promise, to let your yes be yes and your no be no, especially for the husband towards his wife. And there's a reason for that. For the female in a marriage, um, one of the things that they hang on to is trust and security. They need security. Um, now, ladies, if 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 you're you know if you're on your own, understand that your same need is there for security. My mom raised my brother and myself, and I guarantee that she still wanted us to live in a safe area, to be taken care of, to be provided for. It was still her basic need was to be secure. And so the mistake that sometimes husbands make is that we break that trust, we break that security of making her feel safe whenever we don't keep a promise or maybe we haven't told the truth. Now, now here's the deal. We are flawed in that way, but God isn't. When God makes a promise, he keeps that promise. Amen? And in Matthew chapter 28, he says that I will be with you always, even until the very end of the age. Um, also in Isaiah 41.10, if you want to find Isaiah, it's a few pages back from, quite a few pages back from uh, Daniel. But Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, Isaiah writes there, of the Lord, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. His promise is that he will be there for us. And then in Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. I hear a few pages turn in. That's a good thing. Philippians 4, verses 5 through 7. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so Paul writes there and says, Don't, you know, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. His promise is that he is with us. He is near us. He, he carries us through at, at, at difficult times. I think of the 23rd Psalm, that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. So, so believe that promise. God never leaves us, nor does he forsake us. And I know that what happens is that there's the tendency... To, to think that God leaves, to doubt him. And Kara, again, in the song, uh, uh, Laura, I can't even think of her last name, Story. Laura's story captures that so well, that sometimes we doubt him. Sometimes we feel like he's not there with us, but he is because he's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. So know that God is holy and good, Believe his promise. Third, stop fighting for control. 
Stop fighting for control in your life. So, so often, you know, we step in and we try to fix it because we either think that God is slow in keeping his promise or that he's just neglected us in some way. Sometimes the best thing that you can do is just allow, allow the course to, to take place with whatever it is that you're facing. Stop fighting for control. And here in the book of Daniel, this is where we're going to come back to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. Yeah, I closed it, so i got to find it again. Daniel 3, verse 8. We left off last week, um, we left off last week talking about how uh, Nebuchadnezzar had built this statue of gold. And just to catch you up real quickly, uh, he built this statue of gold and he said now, when the trumpets and the lyre and the flutes and all these instruments play, you bow down before them. And so basically everybody does. You know, the, the, the instruments play, they bow down. And then comes verse 8. Then comes verse 8. At, the, at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now I want to pause there for just a second. I mean the story goes like this. That these jealous individuals come along and they say, um, we're going to tell on these three guys. And, 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 and not only that, but I mean, notice, notice how much worse they try to make. King, they work for you. I mean, these guys are working for you, and yet they're not doing what you tell them to do. And, and verse 13 then says that Nebuchadnezzar is furious with rage. He becomes furious, and he summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now... When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then catch this last phrase. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Can I tell you the kind of God that's going to rescue them? A God who is holy and good. And who keeps his promises. A God who is holy and good. And who keeps his promise. N notice here. Basically what happens. Um, is that the enemy tries to use fear and manipulation. To control. Um, to control their. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like he does in our lives. Um, I hesitate in sh at sharing this because I, I don't really want to make people suspicious, okay? Because we are the church. And when people come to church, we ought to welcome them, we ought to greet them. But for the last couple of elections, here's what I've noticed. Presidential elections, what begins to happen in, in our churches is that single individuals will begin to show up. They'll come. In fact, one, one was here last week. He was here, and he was only here for one reason. It was to find out how political this congregation is. Now, again, this is, 
you know, I know that there's all sorts of conspiracy theories and all those kinds of things out there, but I want you to understand that I have observed this. I know I talk with other ministers, and it happens. There are individuals, and what they're, what they're looking for is for me to say something or for a leader to say something because then what they want to try to threaten us with is tax-exempt status. They want to take that away about whether or not I'm political or not or we are political, politically motivated. And, and, and what I want, to, want you to see is that they, they try to use fear and manipulation in keeping people from telling the truth. And honestly, it's, it's not going to work here you know first of all i don't tend i I really tend not to be politically motivated at all am i going to talk about issues and you've heard me say this before when i talk about the gay and lesbian issue the same sex relationship there's a reason that i'm against that it's because the bible says that it is wrong and it's sin and i will have no one in this nation dictate to me what i call sin or what the Bible calls sin. And if that causes us to get in trouble with whoever it is that is coming in here, then we'll get in trouble. You know, I'm going to talk about the abortion issue. I'm going to talk about the care for uh, the poor. And honestly, how poor a job our government is doing in caring for the poor. That's not care for them when you just simply let them sit on their butts all the time and, and never, ever... Uh, and never ever call them to any sort of sense of responsibility. That's not care. That's careless. And so I'm going to talk about those sorts of things. And, and, and so I'm not going to be intimidated by anyone uh, when the scriptures speak very soundly on those issues. How do they speak soundly? Second Thessalonians, if you do not work, you do not eat. How clear is that? In the Old Testament, they had a welfare system for the Jewish people. Yes, they did. But what it meant was that there were crops that were left behind so that those people could get up and go out and gather for themselves. Get up off the couch and do something. Um, I'm always going to, to, to speak on those issues and about those issues. And no government and no agency is, is going to intimidate me now here again i want to say this again just because you see a single individual come in and you don't know them okay uh we are to welcome we are to welcome them and and i will indeed uh be there to to welcome them as well but but know that that's the kind of society that we're living in right now where they're so afraid that, that we're trying to, to influence some outcome instead of understanding that we are speaking against very real issues or about very real issues and that our responsibility then is to pray for whoever is in the leadership and to uh, support them through prayer, to support them in, in, in that manner. And, and, and so it's not, a, it's not so much an issue about control because the enemy tries to use that sort of fear and manipulation to keep us under under their thumb. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar does here. He says to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, listen, I'm going to give you another chance. When the, when the music plays, then you bow down. And if you don't, then I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And what God can save you then? What God is it who can save you? Now, I love... I love verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. And so basically... They give control over to the Father. See, no matter how much we think we are in control, ultimately we have none. Ultimately we have none. 
I mean, you can have all the plans that you want about your future, and you're really not in control. To me, this is a reminder of all of you who have day planners and, and calendars that are color-coded, um, how worthless they really are. Um, I mean, don't take me wrong on that, because I know that there are people who are planners and that sort of thing, and, and, and that's what kind of keeps you going and, and drives you. But you know what? Ultimately, you have no control. It's kind of like, remember the story in the New Testament, the guy who says, I'm going to build bigger barns, bigger storehouses, and God comes and says, you fool, this very night your life is required, and what good is that barn going to do you? Now, Jesus isn't teaching that we shouldn't plan for the future. What he's teaching is that we trust in God for our future. And so we plan things, we, you know, we, we build things, we work through things, but ultimately we understand that he is in control. And that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do. They say, oh, king, here's the deal. You can throw us into that furnace. We're not going to bow down to the music. And you can throw us in there, and here's what will happen. God will either save us or he won't. But we will be faithful to him. He will either rescue us from the furnace or he won't. But we still will not bow. And the only way that that can happen in our lives is when we stop fighting for control. I remember the story of Cassie Bernalt, and many of you do as well, at Columbine. She had much the same attitude when they came to her and they asked her, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? And she said, yes. In fact, there's a book by that same title. She said, yes. And you know what? God, God could have delivered her. He could have. But he didn't in that moment. And sometimes I wonder if the reason that he doesn't is for the rest of us. Now let that sink in for just a second. Maybe the reason that Cassie was martyred and make no mistake, she is a martyr. Maybe the reason that Cassie died that day was for us. To strengthen us. To look at the faith of a young lady who was not afraid to say, God, I'm going to give you control here. And I'm going to trust you. And she said, yes. You know, Every story would be wonderful if it ended like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story. Or, or if they ended like Tangled, you know. I'm very familiar with the movie Tangled. Riker and I watch it often. And I have to confess that at the end, sometimes whenever he falls asleep or Rock and Emily come and get him, I go ahead and watch the end of it anyway. Because it's one of those stories. It's just one of those stories that ends well. They, they lived happily ever after. And it would be wonderful. Now, I mean, here's the deal. In, in, in the end, when Jesus returns, that, that part is going to come true. We will live happily forever with him. But it requires that we stop fighting for control here. And that we learn to trust him. Number four, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Um, I've already stated this, but when you're going through trial and stress, sometimes it's hard to see that God is there with you, right? I mean, would you all agree with that? It's very hard to see that he's there with you. But we just have to open our eyes. I mean, part of opening our eyes is going back and knowing that in the past, he's kept his promise. In the past, here's my experience with with God. He has seen me through. He has carried me through. And so open your eyes, and I guarantee that you'll see him. Open your eyes. You will experience his presence with you. And in verse 25, even Nebuchadnezzar, this, this pagan king from Babylon, he, he looks down. Oh, by the way, to kind of catch you up, at least this part of the story, 
Nebuchadnezzar throws them in. They play the music. They don't bow. He has them tied up with very strong men, the strongest guards that he has. He says, heat the furnace seven times hotter. I mean, that's just like the enemy. He turns up the heat. When things are, when things are getting difficult, he'll even turn the heat up a little bit more. And so seven times hotter than it's ever been. And he takes them there. And, and the guys who throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace, the, the, the fire is so hot that they are killed because of the exposure to the heat and the flames. So they, they push them in. And Nebuchadnezzar is standing at the top of this furnace. I've seen diagrams of what they think this furnace looked like. It's not like they went and opened a door and shoved them in. Uh, it was something that was either built into the ground or they had a place where they could stand above it. Um, but it was very much like a big container. You know, I, I kind of get the idea of like a dumpster that's on fire. But he's, he's, he's heated it seven times hotter and and they're pushed in and these guards perish because they take them up there and then nebuchadnezzar stands at a safe distance to see them consumed by the flames only that's not what he sees he, he looks down into the flames and in verse 25 uh, verse, verses 24 and 25 King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now there are people who want to debate that all the time, but let me tell you what it is. It's... it's uh, uh, an appearance of Jesus with them in the flames. And there will be people who say, well, but that's not what it says. It says that Nebuchadnezzar said it was like one who was like a son of God. That's because this is a pagan looking at it. He doesn't understand what he's seeing. He looks down, and here's what I'll tell you. This is not an angel. This is Jesus right there with them. The pre-incarnate Jesus has shown up because God is a God who keeps his promises. And, and so Nebuchadnezzar looks down, this unbelieving king looks down, and he sees four men in the furnace. Didn't we throw three in, and yet there are four there? And so he's so amazed and, 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 and so um, taken back that he, simply, that he just says, I mean, get this, he's speaking to, to three men who should be burning in the fire, and he tells them, Come out of there. I mean, he's so full of amazement that he... Come out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they do. They come, they come out of the fire. Now, evidently, through a door, maybe someone... I, I have no idea how, how they actually get out of this furnace, but but they come out of the flames. Listen, when, when we are in the midst of trial and, and difficult circumstances, when we are stressed and we are anxious, open your eyes because you will see the presence of God. You will see his mighty hand at work. I think of the story of Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna, who was a student under John, the apostle John, the apostle that Jesus loved taught Polycarp, and he was the bishop of Smyrna. He lived in, uh, to his 80s, and, and they burned him at the stake. Now, when they brought him to the stake to burn him, they were going to nail him to it. And he said, you don't need to do that. You don't need to nail me here. I will stay right here at the stake. And so they said, well, we won't nail you to it, but we're going to tie your hands to the stake. And, and Polycarp is famous for this, for this statement, um, not word for word, just kind of a paraphrase of what he said. He said, 86 years or 87 years, my Lord and my Savior has served me well in this life, and he will serve me and provide for me at this stake. And it's said that as he stood there, 
with the flames coming up around him, that he prayed and he sang unto God because he understood with his eyes wide open that God was there and he was present with him. And so he, 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 he sang as he was being burned at the stake by the Roman guards and soldiers. Well, then finally, number five, embrace freedom. Embrace freedom. Look at the last part of verse 26. We'll, we'll read the whole verse, but it says that Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Embrace your freedom. When God has set you free, you are free indeed. One of the difficulties, one of the difficulties we face, let me finish the story and then I'll tell you the difficulty. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fire. They don't smell like fire. Ladies, if you've ever been curling your hair and you singe your hair, you know what hair smells like burning, right? Guys, if you've ever taken a lit match and put it to the hair on your arm, because I know we do that stupid stuff, <laughs> then you know what burnt hair smells like. And the thing is, is they come out and they don't even smell like singed hair. Not a hair on their head has been singed. I know I've said this, used this illustration before, but we go to the bowling alley every Monday night, and you know, how long has the ban on smoking indoors been? Four years? Four or five? Has it been that long? You still come out of the bowling alley smelling like smoke. It just gets in, you know, it's just in everything in there. They don't smell like it. I mean, they've been in the, this, this furnace, and they don't smell like smoke. They're not burned. There's no charred uh, places on their clothing. And, 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 and they come out. Um, and, and, and the king is so impressed that he basically goes into this, this kind of a, a decree in which he says, may no one worship anyone but the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the one true God, he is greatly impressed with what's just happened. Now, one of the issues I think in living in our society that is so difficult for us is that we know that we're set free, but oftentimes we come along and we bend over and we pick all that stuff up again. You know, I was, in our Bible study, we were discussing this. You know, what happens when you don't feel like, you know, you're really forgiven? And I bet there's not a person in here who doesn't go through that from time to time. Can I tell you what happens? God, God is really confused because God is going, I don't remember that. And, and, and the issue is, is that we've, We've stooped down and we've picked the baggage up all over again. If the Son has set us free, then we are free indeed. And He expects us to embrace that freedom. To know that He's with us. To know that He's good and holy and that He will see us through. And we don't need to bend over and pick all that stuff up. Max Lucado had a book uh, entitled Traveling Light. Great, great book. But in it, he talks about this, this habit that we have of picking all that stuff up again. Whenever what, whenever what God has done with it is his promises that he's thrown it into the sea of forgetfulness, sea of forgetfulness never to be remembered against us again. That he's forgiven us. There's one last aspect of this passage that I want you to catch. And, and, and I'm certainly not smart enough to, to come up with this. I, 
uh, I was listening to a preacher, Perry Noble, and, and I listened to what he said about this. Have, have you ever really thought about that what happens is in the story, three men are thrown into the fire, but in the midst of the flames, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the trial, there are four men present. And one of them is our Lord. And when they're rescued, when they're called out, three men come out. No, Noble says, is it possible that what Jesus does is that he stays in the flames? He stays in the fire. He stays in the trial. Now, don't take it literally, but more symbolically. And you know why he stays there? For us. Because the next time we're facing hardship, the next time we're facing stress, his promise is, I'm there with you. I will always be there with you. Um, that's the promise that, that God makes. God's promise is that he will always be there to take us through the fire. So listen, listen to this song as we close the service.